Hey, City Church, so glad you joined us today. Hey, I've got some announcements and some updates for you. Uh, some of you have asked, when will we begin to meet together on Sunday in a large gathering? Uh, that is something that we are taking week by week. And we're asking the questions, how do we ensure your safety, the safety uh, of our family and our kids? And uh, a lot of just different questions that we are evaluating. And so we don't know yet. Uh, in the meantime, it, as we're in this kind of in-between season, we are just leaning into micro churches. And we're gonna ask you to do that. If you've kind of been waiting and you haven't engaged in a micro church yet, now is the time. In fact, we are launching a ton of new micro churches in the next few weeks. And so it's, we've made it easy for you. All you have to do is go to our landing page, citychurchtulsa.com slash microchurch. It's where all of our resources are. There's a little form on there. Fill it out and we will get you connected to a micro church. Uh, you're not signing up for this micro church forever. This is kind of a temporary solution as we navigate kind of this unknown in this season. In a micro church right now, they're completely online. Uh, it's a time for you to, to pray for each other, encourage each other. You listen to the sermon, go through the discovery questions, and look for opportunities to love and serve each other and those around you. And we want you to be in a place where you're growing. And so if you've waited, now is the time to jump in. Uh, people have asked, why is micro church the right thing for us? Well, number one, this is the vision of City Church both now and in the future. We believe the most effective way to make disciples and to see our city transformed by the gospel. Uh, the second reason is this, uh, it allows us to create these smaller gatherings to ensure your safety and social distancing guidelines. And so by creating these smaller little micro churches, we're able to better control the environment and to make sure that you're safe. And then number three is this, uh, these micro churches allow us to be flexible and adaptable to changing circumstances. We don't know what's gonna happen a month, three months from now. We don't know if we're gonna be back in a safe at home order. And so instead of trying to predict the unknowns, micro church allows us to be flexible. It allows us to continue to be the body of Christ, even in uh, changing and unknown circumstances. And so make sure you jump on our landing page, citychurchtulsa.com slash microchurch. Sign up for a micro church and we'll help you get connected. City Church, I want to say thank you for your continued generosity and faithfulness through this entire uh, process. And uh, your faithfulness has allowed us to meet the needs of a lot of individuals, people who have uncertainty with jobs or have lost their job or uh, and just need supplies or groceries. Uh, these are people both inside our church and outside our church that we've been able to meet their needs because of your generosity. Also, uh, we've been able to continue to move forward with the vision of the future home of City Church. And so that is still something we're working on and moving towards. And if you have not yet seen the pictures uh, of both the interior and exterior of the building and what it will be, it, it's fantastic. And we know that God is going to use this place uh, to make disciples and to see our city transformed. Your continued faithfulness allows us to stay on track and continue to move towards this vision that God has given us. So thank you. Thank you for partnering with us during this time. If you're used to giving in person or if you haven't yet moved your giving digitally, we're gonna ask you to do that. You can go to cc.guide or you can go to citychurchtulsa.com slash give, set up online giving or use our text to give. Thank you, your giving is changing lives. Today, I am excited uh, about what you're about to hear. Our lead pastors of our City West location, Bodie and Rachel Sanders are gonna bring the word today uh, about finding community in this time of quarantine. So grab your phone, go to cc.guide, click on the talk notes, get ready uh, to receive God's word that he has for you today. City Church family, both West and Midtown, we are so excited to be with you today, wherever and however you're viewing with us. We miss seeing each and every one of you in real life, and we look forward to the day that we're able to do that again. But Man, in the meantime, can we just say we love watching your microchurches and how they are thriving in this season. What a beautiful gift from God that he's been preparing City Church well before all this happened for what it would look like to think outside the walls of Sunday Church and what it would look like to empower the people of the church to go and to be on mission and to what it would look like for us to be pursuing making disciples in the city of Tulsa. And now here we are, and this is real life. And micro, micro churches are such a beautiful gift in this season. Today, we're going to be continuing the theme of answering some of the questions that are on all of our minds right now in this cultural moment. Pastor Matt, a few weeks ago, sent out a survey that a lot of you responded to of just like, hey, what's on your heart? 
what's on your mind and, and in your soul? What are some of the questions that you're having? And we've been tackling some of those questions over the last couple of weeks, and today is no different. And I think one of the glaring issues that I would guess that almost all of us are having right now and facing is the struggle to maintain community in the midst of a quarantine. Uh, quarantined community. I bet that's probably something none of us ever thought that we would ever say. <laughs> but in this crazy time in our world where one of the most loving things that we can do for the most vulnerable around us is to be physically apart, where does this leave us in when it comes to community? And I think one of the beautiful things that this is awakening inside a lot of us is in our time and our forced time apart, we are realizing our deep need to be together. Yeah, for sure. You know, this is something that we we really believe. Like, man, community was written on our hearts. Like, it, it's a community is a part of our spiritual DNA, if you will. It's the whole idea and the creation narrative of being formed in the image and the likeness of God. And I, I love the language in Genesis where um, God's creating all of these things, all these wonderful, beautiful things, like all of creation. And then he gets to what we call the pinnacle of his creation, mankind. And he says, let us make man in our own image. And um, man, how, how true is it then that our God exist inside of community as Father, Son, and Spirit. And if that's true, and we were formed in His image, in His likeness, then that community is a part of us as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and you know, community is such an essential part in the way of Jesus. We see this in his call to his disciples. Um, they were called to, to follow him, yes, but it was Jesus's way of doing life um, was all about community. They were in community. In fact, in the gospels, again, love the language, but um, Peter at one time, or probably a couple of different times, I'm sure, because it's the apostle Peter and he doesn't know how to not say things. Um, but there was a time where, where um, there's like a tense moment and everything and Peter looks at Jesus and says, like, but what about us? We forsake everything. Or another way that you could look at that or see it translated is like, we gave up everything to follow you, to come be a part of life, to do life the way that you do it. The whole idea of Jesus's call to his disciples was to come follow me, to learn, to grow, to be formed and shaped into his image. And if that was true for them mm -hmm. in, in, in their community, in their time with Jesus, then it's so true for us today. Right. But the truth about community is that even before this pandemic, even before this moment that we're living in right now in our world, and it's safer to be at home and the stay at home order, this has been a growing issue in our culture. A few stats I want to throw at you. Loneliness rates in the U.S. have doubled since the 1980s. 35% of Americans report they are chronically lonely. So not just I'm lonely every once in a while, I'm chronically lonely. Only 8% report they've had a conversation with their neighbor over the previous year. In 1984, the average American had three confidants. In a recent report, 25% say they had none. And so this is not just a right now problem. This has been a growing issue. And I think for us today in 2020, one of the mistakes that we make is this. We mistake connectivity for community. And this is not a new sentence. You've probably heard this before, but I, it just bears repeating today because we are more connected than ever before. With a couple of clicks of a button, we can be connected to someone across the world. And honestly, that's one of the beautiful gifts that we have available to us today. I mean, that's the yeah. reason that we're able to stay connected to you all right now. It's the reason that I can FaceTime my family and Zoom and have meetings. And technology is a beautiful gift. I, ha I have had many prayers with the Lord of like, thank you so much for tech technology right now and, and journal, journal writings and all of those things. But we know based on these stats and what's all going on that this technology in and of itself is not the answer. In fact, a lot of times it makes things worse. There's study after study that shows that there is a direct correlation between how much time we spend on the internet and on social media platforms to how lonely we feel. The more time we spend there, the more lonely we're likely to be. And I think we can probably all say that we have experienced that yeah. social media spiral. And what I really feel like is whatever you're already feeling on the inside, 
those kind of spirals that when you get on the, those social media platforms, it just magnifies that. Yeah. So if I'm feeling lonely or if I'm feeling re- having a really bad day, I need to connect with someone and I hop on social media for that connection. What I'm going to see is the best parts of everyone else's life. Everybody's living their best life now. Everyone is at a party one of these days when we can party again. Okay. <laughs> or they're, they're with their family. They, they have all of these things. You, we think, Everyone has it so much better than I do, and we spiral, and it magnifies those feelings. And so this connectivity is not the answer that we're talking about. This is not the community that we're talking about. Jesus' invitation, just like he invited those disciples into this idea of community, his invitation to us, um, his, his idea of community is very different than what can be coined as community today. So yeah. let's look at that a little bit. What is community in the way of Jesus? Yeah, I think— to answer that question, what does community in the way of Jesus look like? Um, you've got to go to the community uh, portion of scripture, right? Acts chapter two, starting in verse 42. And we're gonna actually pull this up on the screen and you can follow along, I'll read it to you. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul and, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And I think that we could all just go shout a hearty amen to that, (laughs) right? Like that is such that's such a great passage of scripture. And again, here we are. Um, one of the things, like if you'll dive into scripture and, and let it wash over you, you'll start to realize that, man, language in scripture is so, so unbelievably intentional. Like Luke's language here, I mean, they, 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 we see the word they in this passage of scripture just continuously. They had all things in common. They were together in their homes, breaking bread, having dinner. They were day by day going to the temple. But when I think about community, even in this um, likeness, biblical community, what's it really look like? I think we find it there in the first couple of words. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. That word fellowship comes from the Greek word koinonia. Um, We in our modern, uh, in modern times, like fellowship can mean a lot of things. It could mean something as simple as um, passing your buddy in the lobby on Sunday mornings, high-fiving, how are you, good, me too, walk off, maybe not see them for a week or two because they go to a different service usually than you do. Um, and, And we can consider that fellowship. But this koinonia type of fellowship, it is a deep, Deep life on life, abiding, vulnerable, like we're in this together, yeah. thick or thin. We're, this is who we are. And, and, and as the church um, then and the church now, like our fellowship, our community, we find that its foundation is Jesus. And that is so, that, that's so important because Jesus is more than enough. Often in culture, um, we find our community laced with or wrapped around or the foundation of what we call community sometimes in culture being race or gender, socioeconomics, political leanings. Maybe it's just like you're in the same space of life as me, so let's like hang out. Um, Pastor Matt's made this joke a lot of times. You're in college, that's kind of your community, but that's forced community. Um, We see that um, biblical community, it's so much deeper than that. And, and And I think that most of us, when we hear this, there's not a single one of us that says, you know what? That sounds great, but that's not really what I'm looking for. So now nah, I'll pass. I don't think any of us are would would hear that this is the kind of community that that Jesus is not only calling us to, but inviting us into, yeah. and say, I don't want anything to do with that. Um, I think we would all be like, Yeah, sign me up. But even with that understanding, there are still barriers that keep us from that deep abiding life on life, completely vulnerable, completely open. Um, like, you know the best of me, you know the worst of me uh, type of community. And so this morning, what we want to do is take a little bit of time and, um, and just identify a couple of those barriers. So if you're following along or taking notes, the first one is this, it's individualism. Individualism can be such a barrier 
to community. And here's why. Like, in community, like, you have to give some things up sometimes. And, and this is where the rub usually comes um, for most of us um, because, man, we just don't like giving things up very often. I, 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 I was thinking about this this week and um, as we were preparing for this talk time. And, man, Growing up, I've ha always had a couple of hobbies that are just super time consuming. I love to fish. I love to golf. And so like as, as a single person, like I could do that whenever I wanted to. I could on a whim get up and be like, man, it's a beautiful day. I'm going golfing or it's a beautiful day. I'm going to go fishing. Um, and I would do that. I would, I would, I would not have to sacrifice for, for someone else because I was just making choices for me. And then Rachel and I got married and, um, I can remember like a week or so, um, into our marriage, young, you know, it's new and everything. And I had a friend of mine who was actually one of my groom call me up and say, hey, let's go golf, man. I'm going to Sand Springs. You want to come with me? It was a Friday um, mid-morning, and I was like, I've got nothing else to do. Rachel's at work. Yeah, let's do this. The only problem was I didn't let her know about it. So I go and I have, I, I golf, and I get home about six o'clock that evening. She's sitting on the couch, has no idea where I've been, and I learned a very valuable lesson in that moment. Like, I can't just make decisions for myself anymore. There's somebody else who's, um, who, who is expecting me to make that decision with them. It, that's very similar to community. And then, um, so that's marriage. Then we had children. And then life's over there for a minimum of 18 years, that's right? And then, and then we decided three <laughs> is a good number. So <laughs> that number just grew exponentially. Um, but, but there are other people. Rachel and I no longer can like just on a whim, go take a weekend vacation. Like we have other human beings that depend on us for our survival. The point of this is this, like, like in community, sometimes we have to sacrifice um, our wants, our needs for the greater good of the community. And that's not always fun for us. Yeah. Yeah. Second barrier is this idealism. So many of us have an unrealistic picture of yeah. what community should look like and what it should feel like. And then we are let down with the reality. We read scriptures like the one we just read in the book of Acts, and we make unfair, idealistic comparisons. And if you've been with City Church for the last few months, you know, we just walked through the majority of the book of Acts and yeah. it's not all like rainbows and roses. It's not, it's, it's got some rough corners. It gets a little bit messy because people are messy. In his book, Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes this, the sooner this shock of disillusionment comes to an individual and a community, the better for both. Every human wish dream that is injected into the Christian community is a hindrance to genuine community and must be banished if genuine community is to survive. He who loves the dream of community more than the community itself becomes a destroyer of the latter. Can I stop you? Dietrich Bonhoeffer just seems like a joy to hang out with, doesn't he? <laughs> Dropping those truth bombs. Yeah. And, and most of it, you're like, I'm going to need you to repeat that. Yes, like, please. that was way over my head. Could you please explain this to me? So Bodhi just went into this a little bit, but I was 19 and he was 21 when we got married. And as well as the people around us tried to prepare us, let's face it, like we were babies when we got married and we didn't know what we were doing. And the picture of what we thought marriage was going to be like and the reality of our first three years of marriage, those two things did not line up. We did not understand each other at all. We are very different individuals. We see the world differently. We attack problems differently. Just all the decisions that we would make, we would probably go about it a different way. And we didn't understand how to communicate. And that caused a lot of problems, a lot of little funny things that we can look back on now, but would snowball into big things. And it really was painful. It was a painful time. Now we just celebrated 16 years and it's better than I expected it to be. But that's after a lot of hard work. And that's after like committing to continue the hard work every day, every week. And that's what marriage looks like. And I think one of the main reasons why a lot of marriages fail is due to this idealism. It's due to these wildly um, unrealistic and romanticized versions of what marriage is and what it is actually supposed to be in our lives. And many of us make the same mistake with community. 
Um, as with marriage, people who are idealistic about community tend to wait around for that perfect fit, that our community soulmate, if you will. Or on the flip side of that, we bounce around from community to community, from group to group and church to church, and never able to commit and put down roots. The reality of community is it's both beautiful and yeah. broken. It will sometimes hurt you, and yet it is one of the most life-giving things offered to us in this world. Yep. It's both and, not either or. And the sooner that we can embrace all that it has to offer, the sooner we will see genuine community thrive in our lives. Yeah, that's so good. And the, and the third one is this. It's intimidation. Um, and did we do this on purpose that they all started with an I? I, <laughs> I think it was, wasn't it? Um, so intimidation, it's fear. Like, like we realize that we, like in, in community, we will be laying ourselves bare, right? Like, like this is who I am. And that's terrifying. And it's terrifying for a couple of reasons. The first one is this, like, like the moment that you bear your soul, the deep parts of you to an, another person, um, they all of a sudden have ammunition now. They can either build you up or they can tear you down. So there is like real mm. vulnerability in that. And so that causes some fear and anxiety in us at times. And secondly, it's just for that very reason. Like all of a sudden, I'm going to be sharing with other people the best and the worst of me. I, I realize that like all of our examples here have to do with family, but we've been in quarantine for almost <laughs> two months now and that's who our community is right now. But um, I, I've realized this to be true about my own self. Like, like I am my best and my worst with my family, right? Um, and just um, realizing in this time of uh, quarantine you run out of things to do as parents. And so we've tried to make yard work like fun for our kids. And um, my, two old, my two oldest children, Ella and Lainey, um, could not be more different. Ella is like anything, or Lainey is anything that I can do to have quality time with you, then I'll do it. So if I ask her to come out and help me with the yard work, not only does she come outside and help me, but she's like on my hip the entire time, which is really sweet and really fun for about 15 or 20 minutes. But when I'm actually trying to get something done, she just ends up being in the way. And I, I found myself just the other day kind of losing my cool with her and just being like, would you just go please jump on the trampoline and leave me alone, you know? <laughs> and then Ella, my, um, when all of you see this, will actually be a teenager. She turns 13 uh, on Sunday, May 3rd. And so um, she's the exact opposite. She, if I ask her to do something, she runs the opposite direction of the thing that I ask her to do. Like, oh, wait, you know, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But I just realized that this needs my attention right now. And like, it doesn't take very many times of that happening before I lose my cool with them and, and I need to be corrected, you know? And Rachel's had to correct me a few times. Like, hey, dude, you're a micromanager. You've asked them to do this, let them do it. Even if they mess it up, you can go fix it later tonight. But I just I don't have it in me. It just kind of, like, ooh, just like this tension there, you know? Um, and, and that's something that we have to learn in community is like we are, if we are going to live in true biblical community, then we do have to be ourselves. It's not that I am my worst with my family. It's that I am me with my family, mm. all of me with my family. And the beautiful thing about community is that when we make mistakes, we learn from those, we grow, we repent, and we move on, right? We move on, we make mistakes, we grow, and we move on. Yeah. John Mark, Mark Comer has this quote about community. He says, life in community is Jesus's school of love. And I just think that's so beautiful. That is our hope is that yeah. we would become people of love. And I love this idea of a school because we have so much to learn and we have so much to learn within community and other people um, serve as a mirror for us when we're in, when we're really doing life on life community. Um, I can think I'm a really patient and kind and loving person and then lock me in my house with my family for two months and we'll see how that <laughs> plays out. That's a mirror to me of things yeah. that I need to work on, things that I need to grow. And those are things that you only learn in community. So much of our spiritual formation happens within community. So let's get practical real quick as we end today. How do we take those first steps? What do we do? I, I'm hungry for community. I want more. What do I do? Number one is this, take the initiative. Look at your life and see what's missing. Maybe you would really like to have a spiritual mentor or maybe a friend that's in a similar life stage as you. 
Maybe you need to engage in a microchurch. You've been hearing us talking about it, but you haven't taken that step yet. Look at what's missing and then take the initiative to make it happen. Make the ask for that spiritual mentor. I promise it won't be as bad as you think it's going to be. Ask that friend that has the same age babies as you. Ask, ask him or her out to coffee. Start a microchurch. Mm. That may sound scary, but if that's something that is in your heart and in your desire, just take the initiative. Most of the time, these things do not drop in your lap. you got to yeah. take the initiative. Yeah, for sure. So um, almost done here. Second one, and we're finished. Lean in. Lean into it. Yeah. Um, so often when it comes to true community, the kind of community that we've been talking about today, um, like we get right up to that point where our comfortability has reached its max and, and, and we decide to stop right there. Um, almost like we're hitting one of these walls or barriers that, that we've been talking about. And it's like, I, I, I will go this far and no further. I, I, I know for me personally, um, like being open and honest doesn't come easy. It's a lot of work for me. And there are times that I feel like um, I'm standing at the bottom of the Grand Canyon and I'm looking at the top. I'm looking up there and I'm like, I know if I can just get there, like I would experience life on life in community the way that Jesus intended it. But the problem is, is I've been given dental floss as a rope, right? And, and so there have been times in my life that I have trusted that dental floss to hold and I've made the climb and I've experienced experience community in ways that it's almost hard to explain the openness and the, the vulnerability and the honesty and, and allowing others to have that same um, space that they're allowing me to have in that moment. It's a beautiful thing. And then there are times that I've said, nope, I'm going to stop here where my comfortability has reached its max. And, and, and here's the problem with that, guys, is when we decide that we're not going to push in, that we're not going to lean in, what we do is we rob um, ourselves and others of, of, of the me's, the us's, the one another's that we talk about, that we see in scripture all the time. We rob ourselves of, of each other and the gift that is you, the gift that's me, the gift that is us to one another, right? Yeah. And so if I could give you one encouragement today, it would be that, like just lean in. Imagine almost like in your mind's eye that that wall or barrier that, that's where your comfortability is leaning up against right now, imagine you just reach out and touch it and it just falls over because it's thinner than you think it is. It really is. Yeah. And right on the other side of that, I really believe if we'll push into that and we'll lean into it, um, knock it down and take the steps into deep abiding community, I believe that right on the other side of that, we'll be living the life that Jesus intended us to live, the life, the good life, man, the absolute good life in community with others who are following after Jesus. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, hey, City Church, I want to pray for you right quick. So would you bow your heads with me? Father, we love you today. Jesus, we thank you for um, technology. I know we've prayed this over and over again throughout these videos, Lord, but it is such a blessing that, that even in the midst of quarantine, even in the midst of, of all of the things that would try to be separating us right now, there is a way that we can draw together in this season. And Father, I, I wanna pray, Holy Spirit, even now, would you start to move on our hearts that you would um, start to... Um, Oh man, bring up in our hearts and our minds um, these, these barriers, Lord, that are keeping us from deep abiding uh, biblical community with all of those, uh, all of our brothers and sisters who are following Jesus as well. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's one of the ones that we talked about today, individualism, idealism, intimidation. Maybe it's one that doesn't start with an I. Um, but, but would you reveal to our hearts these barriers, God, and, and give us the strength um, by the power of, of you Holy Spirit to, to push past these things and to take the steps needed into deep abiding community, that koinonia type fellowship, that life on life kind of fellowship that we were created for from the foundations of the earth. Would we lean into this? And, and Lord, as this season of quarantine and pandemic starts to fade, we're just believing that, that you're gonna wipe this thing out in the name of Jesus. But as this starts to fade, May your church come with the hunger that we've had together now. May we come back with an even greater hunger together and to live life in community. And we just give you praise for these things. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.
Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. One quick reminder, if you would like to plug into a microchurch, you can head over to our website, the microchurch page on our website, and fill out that short information form, and we will get you plugged in. We love you guys. Have an awesome week. Love you guys.